Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India The discussion now is focused on ATP dependent transport proteins on the cell membrane. We have been looking at proteins on the cell membrane for which we used this mnemonic TREXA. T stands for transporters on the membrane. The transporters were classified thus and having discussed the other transporters already, we will now look at ATP dependent transporters briefly before we consider the details of each type of transporter in context when we consider the different organ systems. The primary active transporters are also referred to as ion pumps. If both these are ATP dependent transporters, why do we have to classify them separately? What is the comparison between the two? Both of them are ATPase enzymes themselves. The transporter itself is an ATPase enzyme is able to cleave ATP and use the energy to do certain things which will result in transport of substances across the membrane, cell membrane. While ion pumps are specific for some ions, ABC transporters, by the way, ABC here stands for ATP binding cassette, which is a common motif in all these trees three transport uh, in all these transporters. ABC transporters can transport a variety of substances, organic anions, cations, etc. Sometimes they may transport even inorganic ions. While the ion pumps have a high degree of specificity, for example, the proton pumps will pump only protons and the calcium pumps will only transport calcium ions. The ABC transporters lack substrate specificity in the sense there are about 42 families grouped in seven groups while a particular type may transport organic ions, they may transport a whole lot of organic anions for example without much specificity within that group. Now, while the ion pumps will only do active transport, that is movement of the ion against a con concentration gradient, the ABC transporters can be either active or passive transporters. In fact, there are some of them which gate a channel, the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, for example. It is a famous protein, you will come across this when you learn about cystic fibrosis and the sulfonylurea receptors found on insulin secreting cells, these are ABC transporters as well. And ATP hydrolysis will get the channels associated with that ABC transporter. And remember channels allow diffusion of ions. So they do not have to be transporting against the gradient all the time while ion pumps always perform active transport. Where are the ion pumps found in a cell? The sodium potassium pump is found on the plasma membrane. It is present ubiquitously in all eukaryotic cells. There is also a calcium pump on the plasma membrane. There is one other calcium pump which is very important, which is found on the membrane of endoplasmic reticulum what is called sarcoplasmic reticulum in muscle cells. And these two calcium pumps are different in their sequences. So while we call this calcium pump PMCA for plasma membrane calcium ATPase, this one is called CIRCA for sarcoendoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. 
from the direction of transport, you should know that calcium moves actively from the cytoplasm into the endoplasmic reticulum through this pump. Now, this another primary active transporter found on vesicular membranes. These are vesicles in a cell. For example, there could be secretory vesicles, lysosomal vesicles. Many of these vesicles, or almost all of them, have a proton pump on their membrane. And for some reason, acidification of the vesicle seems to be important for its functionality. While these three pumps are classified as P-type ATPases, this one is classified as a V-type ATPase, V probably standing for vesicular. There's one other P-type ATPase, which is not found on all cells, the hydrogen potassium pump. It is found on epithelial cells. And in fact, in the luminal border of the epithelial cells. We know that potassium concentration within a cell is higher than outside. Therefore, this pump moves potassium actively into the cell while extruding hydrogen ions from the cell. The hydrogen potassium pump is found in the luminal border of epithelial cells in the stomach and in the distal renal tubular epithelium. What we have in the stomach is the gastric isoform and what we have here is the renal isoform. The specificities for blockers is different and therefore they can be considered as two independent proteins. Now the V-type ATPase, as I said, the proton pump is found on the vesicular membrane. It may also be found on the plasma membrane. We already saw that in the distal renal tubular epithelium, we have the hydrogen potassium pump on the luminal border. More important than the hydrogen potassium pump for proton secretion in this part of the tubule is the V-type ATPase, located again in the luminal border of the distal renal tubular epithelium. We will now look at some details of these pumps. The sodium potassium pump we already saw is an ubiquitous protein and it's very essential for the life of a cell and for that matter for the life of an organism. You would be surprised to know that in your resting state, say while you're sleeping, 50% of the energy you consume goes entirely to energize the sodium potassium pumps in all the cells of your body. It pumps in potassium while pumping out sodium. 3 sodium is to 2 potassium is its stoichiometry, meaning what is the ratio of the substances transported. A blocker for this pump is digoxin. It is used therapeutically to treat heart failure, to improve the contractility of the heart. Why and how? We will see later. We considered two different types of calcium pumps. The cytosolic calcium concentration is of the order of nanomoles, 100 nanomoles per liter or 0.1 micromole per liter, whereas the extracellular concentration is about 1 millimole per liter. So there is a 10,000 times gradient for calcium across the membrane and the plasma membrane calcium ATPase will pump calcium out of the cell. Elevation of cytosolic calcium can kill the cell. Elevation of cytos cytosolic calcium is an important signaling event. It can switch on certain events within a cell, but that increase should be very brief. Continued increase of calcium within the cytosol can kill the cell. The concentration of calcium within the ER lumen 
is also probably about the same as that of extracellular fluid and the circa pump pushes calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum. In fact, later on when we look at muscle physiology, we will consider the endoplasmic reticulum as a calcium store within the cell which releases calcium for contraction. So, this is a very important pump and any inhibition of this pump and therefore a reduction in ER calcium stores could result in reduced contractility of the heart for example, resulting in heart failure. In this context, we will consider one other protein which we have seen already when we discussed secondary active transporters, the sodium calcium exchanger. We will later see that of these two proteins which are involved in calcium extrusion from a cell, the sodium calcium exchanger is the more important calcium extruding protein, at least in a cardiac cell. I will use this opportunity to emphasize that whenever an antipope transporting two substances in opposite directions is a secondary active transporter, we prefer to use the term exchanger. But if an antipote is a primary active transporter transporting both substances against gradients and deriving its energy by directly cleaving ATP, we would call such an antipope, the best example being the sodium potassium ATPase, that antipote a primary active transporter is better referred to as a pump. Once again, tell yourself what you understand by the term exchanger and by the term pump. And don't ever call any of these channels. Some students have the habit of interchanging these terms, but these terms are used very specifically for certain types of transporters. Channels are channels, exchangers are exchangers, and pumps are pumps. The hydrogen potassium pump, this is an antipode, which is an ATPase enzyme, and we will call it a pump, therefore. We saw that there are two isoforms, a gastric isoform and a renal isoform. The gastric isoform is responsible for acid secretion in the stomach. And in case of acidity, if a person is suffering from high acidity in the stomach leading to pain in that region, blockers of this transporters are used to reduce pain and to treat the symptoms. And a well-known blocker used therapeutically is omeprazole or pantoprazole. The renal isoform of hydrogen potassium pump is not inhibited at the concentrations of amiprazole that are used for treating gastric acidity. We already saw that the V type proton pump, which is located on vesicles, is also located in the luminal border of the distal renal tubular epithelium. On the vesicles, it is responsible for acidification of the vesicles and in the distal tubule, this pump is responsible for acid extrusion and associated bicarbonate generation in the distal tubule. And an inhibition of this pump, there is a variety of drugs that can inhibit this pump which are used for other purposes which can inhibit this pump. An inhibition of this pump results in a very peculiar syndrome called type 1 distal renal tubular acidosis, type 1 DRTA, which is a special type of metabolic acidosis and the clinical profile of this condition is different from all other types of metabolic acidosis. We will learn the details later, but it does help you to remember that type 1 DRTA is due to inhibition of the proton pumps in distal tubule. To summarize, we have considered primary active transporters thus far. We have four different 
P type ATPases and a V type ATPase. There are two locations of the V type ATPase. One is in the vesicles of all cells on the vesicular membrane and the other is in the luminal border of the distal renal tubular epithelial cells. So you notice that primary active transporters are fewer and you can count them on your fingers. Each one may have multiple isoforms. There are for example nine known isoforms of the sodium potassium pump. Nevertheless, there is a lot of homology between these isoforms. Having seen the P and V type ATPases, we will consider a special type of transporter, the F type ATPase, <coughs> also known as ATP synthase. While these two ATPases use the energy liberated by cleaving ATP to move an ion against its concentration gradient, <coughs> This does the reverse. It allows an ion, protons, to move along its concentration gradient and captures the energy released due to this hexagonic process of downhill movement of the ion to generate ATP. The F type ATP is therefore is also called ATP synthase. The ATP synthase is located on the inner mitochondrial membrane. This is a cartoon of ATP synthase taken from Biophysical Journal 2004. The authors are Dietrich et al. I have kind of inverted that so that we can place it there. That's the inner mitochondrial membrane. You know, mitochondria has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And there is an intermembrane space that is shown in red here. The green is the mitochondrial matrix. So if that is the intermembrane space, the membrane per se, and the mitochondrial matrix, this pump is located on the membrane. There is this region within the membrane, mitochondrial membrane, which transports protons downhill. Protons are heavily concentrated in the intermembrane space in the mitochondrion. Why and how? We will study when we do cellular respiration. But protons are highly concentrated in this red region and they would bind to this transporter and the way it goes there are eight binding sites on this protein and when a hydrogen ion binds to that site, it moves, it rotates. So for every successive ion binding, this protein rotates within the cell membrane and that causes rotation of the shaft and here you have the other component of this protein which kinds of undergoes conformational changes which result in synthesis of ATP when the subunit heaves, literally kind of breathes, ADP and inorganic phosphate move in and ATP comes out. That's how this ATP synthase works. And why did we have to learn all this detail? Because it's amazing. In fact, somebody did a very smart thing. They put a fluorescent tag on this part of the protein and they videoed movement of that fluorescent tag with fluorescent microscopy. That's the Nature paper from that group published in 1997, Noji et al. And I took this video from the site and we will see a short clip of this video just now. There are a number of interesting videos where you can see animations of this protein. This is one good site for you to see.
Now, having considered primary active transporters, we will now move on to ABC transporters, ATP binding cassette transporters. The ABC transporters are found on prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. There are four subunits, that is the ATP binding region and they tend to move substances out of the cell. Now, they are found in bacteria as well as in mammalian cells. In bacteria, they could be importing substances and extruding substances. They could be importers or exporters, whereas in mammalian cells, they are only exporters. They always move a substance out of the cell. We already saw that though they hydrolyze ATP, the transport itself need not necessarily be active transport. In fact, the mode of transport has been described very elegantly as something like a hydrophobic vacuum pump. For example, any toxin which is able to diffuse through the cell membrane. While it is still in the lipid phase, even before it has entered the cell, it can be scooped up by the ABC transporters and pushed out of the cell. So, they are important for preventing a whole load of toxins from entering the cell. However, their importance in therapeutics is especially because of this function. We will see why. There are these classes of ABC transporters, ABC, A, ABC, B, etc. And the most studied transporter is ABC B1, which is also called the P glycoprotein and the multi-drug resistance protein. The name itself would have already told you what this protein does. In cancer therapeutics, the multi-drug resistance protein found on cancer cells, they may even be overexpressed on cancer cells. Now, these cells will not allow the anti-cancer drugs that are given to enter the cell. Even before entering the cell, the anti-cancer drug may be thrown out. And therefore, these cancers are resistant to treatment. That is why it is called the multi-drug resistance protein. In fact, certain cancers may be resistant to multiple drugs. So, these proteins found on prokaryotic cells, like in bacteria, are also responsible for resistance to antimicrobial therapy, resistance to antibiotic therapy. There are some other better studied ABC proteins which are responsible for drug resistance. One of them is the ABCC1 called MRP, again multi-drug resistance protein. For some reason this is called MDR and this is called MRP. ABCG2 is BCRP or the breast cancer resistance protein. Now, this is a Wikipedia classification of the proteins and the group of substances that are transported by each family of transporters. I will let you take a look at this if you need to. We are not interested in these details right now, but keep in mind that the ABC transporters are very important for a clinician to understand because these transporters found on bacterial cells will push out antibiotics from the bacterial cell and therefore contribute to antibiotic resistance. And the ones that are found on cancer cells confer resistance to chemotherapy. Therefore, there is a lot of research into the strategies that have to be adopted to overcome resistance to chemotherapy in cancer cells, for example. You might have to use drugs which are not substrates for the ABC transporters. These are examples of such drugs. While other drugs like winblastin, colchicin, etc., will be extruded. And if there is overexpression of ABC transporters on cancer cells, those are the particular cancer types and patients who are resistant to chemotherapy. 
some response to chemotherapy because of overcoming these effluxes. Now, there have been various attempts to inhibit the ABC exporters with small molecules. A whole load of small molecules have been screened and in animal studies, if small molecules show some efficacy in preventing resistance to chemotherapy, when it comes to clinical trials in human beings, what Wikipedia says is that small molecule inhibitors for ABC transporters have been a big failure. However, a recent strategy is to do RNA interference to prevent these effluxes from pushing out chemotherapeutic drugs. We are coming to the end of the session now. We have considered some details of the transporters on the cell membrane, all these types of transporters. Our next consideration will be the reg of the TREXA, the receptors, enzymes and G proteins on the cell membrane. These three proteins will be considered in the next module which we call cell signaling mechanisms or second messenger signaling mechanisms. Thank you for watching this NPTEL lecture.